This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Monday, the 5th day of December in the year 2022. I'm Gordon Mosley reporting and here's what we're tracking tonight. Police and GPL emergency crews were summoned to the success squatting area on the east coast of Demerara this morning after a couple was found electrocuted in an alleyway leading to their home. The two dead persons were identified by relatives as Sarojini Hansaraj and Prahalal Jagnarain. The woman worked as a nurse while the man operated a taxi. The bodies were discovered early this morning, and it is suspected that the two may have come into contact with an illegal electricity connection in the area while they were heading home. Parts of the alleyway were flooded after the heavy downpour over the weekend, according to persons in the area. The couple's young daughter discovered the bodies in the alleyway after she went in search of them. The daughter explained to police investigators that her mom left home at around 6 o'clock this morning to meet her dad on the main roadway. She said after she did not see the two returning home after close to an hour, she ventured outside where she saw the bodies in the alleyway and raised an alarm. Neighbors rushed out and contacted emergency services after noticing the two bodies lying motionless. The police said both bodies were found with burn marks to the hands and the back of the necks, and two electrical wires that formed an illegal connection were spotted hanging in the area, from the couple's home to a GPL power line. The incident has once again thrown the spotlight on illegal connections in many of the squatting communities and the dangers that those illegal connections pose. Tonight, investigations are ongoing into the tragic incident. More news coming up in just a moment. Something big is here. GTT presents the moment you've all been waiting for. Tis the season to drive with GTT. Get your chance to be one of four lucky winners of a Toyota Raze. Plus, weekly giveaways and more. Simply activate a prepaid plan. Sign up for Fiber and Voice Plan, pay any two bills with MMG, or join the GTT family. And vroom! It could be you! Four Toyota Raises, four winners, drug with GTT. And Office Max, we're all about customer satisfaction. Whether it's clothing and shoes for the ladies, gents, and kids, or for the latest electronics or hardware appliance, we're always thinking of satisfying you, our dear customers. Now you can shop online at www.giftlandofficemax.com or visit us at the Giftland Mall, where we're happy to serve each and every one of you. Public Bank, we're the one for you. Mobile One is more than oil. It's many oils. It transforms at the molecular level. When cold, it's thicker than honey. When hot, it's thinner than water. Mobile One adapts and readapts to last longer. 16,000 kilometers between oil changes. That's your engine evolved. Saul Gayan is the authorized distributor of mobile lubricants. Get in the game with Buster! When a full game is set up, Xbox X, gaming chair, gaming speaker and headset, or any of over 60 weekly prizes, like Oculus Quest 2, Mini 2 Drone, Nintendo Switch, and many more top gaming prizes. Check below for details. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's tell you now that Christmas preparations in the East Coast and Aurora communities of Good Hope and Luziknan were dampened on Saturday after a 29-year-old man was electrocuted while erecting a metal Christmas tree in the Luziknan area outside the home of a businessman during some rainy conditions. The dead youth has been identified as machinist Deepak Ramdin. Ramdin along with a group of men were in the process of erecting the 27 foot tall metal tree when the star on top of the tree came into contact with an electrical wire from a power pole. A wave of electricity rushed through the metal tree resulting in Ramdin and three other men receiving electrical shocks and being pitched to the ground. All of the men were rushed to the hospital, where the 29-year-old died while receiving treatment. The other men were admitted with serious injuries to the burns unit of the Georgetown Hospital. An investigation into that incident has been launched. Turning now to the National Assembly, the National Assembly this morning cleared the $2.9 billion in advances taken from the contingency fund by the government. The approval, however, followed a series of exchanges as the opposition grilled the government's side in its decision to take money from the fund for activities deemed not to be urgent or unforeseen. At the level of the Committee of Supplies, the opposition member of Parliament, Volder Lawrence, asked Prime Minister Mark Phillips to defend the additional $1.7 billion allocated to his office when in February the House approved a whopping $3.5 billion for issuance of subsidies and contributions to local organizations. MP Lawrence was keen in pointing out that the sum taken from the contingency fund represents almost 50% of the voted provision included in the national budget. In response, the Prime Minister explained that the added provision was as a result of the steep rise in fuel prices, resulting in government having to pay more for the provision of electricity to the linen community. As a caring government, Mr. Speaker, we have decided that notwithstanding the increased cost in fuel, government will absorb that cost and not pass it on to the people of Guyana. And Mr. Speaker, that is the only reason why we requested this money to keep the lights on in Linden, Region 10. According to the Prime Minister, $1.7 billion is reflective of an invoice submitted by the Bosai Minerals Company for electricity supply to Linden Electricity Company Incorporated. Dissatisfied with the response, leader of the opposition, Aubrey Norton, pressed the Prime Minister for a detailed breakdown of the increases that led to the need for an additional $1.7 billion. But the question did not sit well with the Prime Minister, who told the House that he will not provide the information that is already in the public domain, as he alluded to the increasing price of fuel on the world market. But Mr. Norton said while the opposition is not against government subsidizing the cost of electricity in Linden, it has a responsibility to scrutinize the expenditure. The government was also grilled in its decision to take $48.85 million from the contingency fund for the hosting of Amerindian Heritage Month, when it had ample time to approach the House for the sum to be taken from the consolidated fund. It was Member of Parliament Lawrence who inquired from Minister of Amerindian Affairs Pauline Sukai why the government had not included sufficient provisions in the national budget for Amerindian Heritage Month celebrations. In response, Minister Sukai explained that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Amerindian Affairs Ministry had downsized the activities for Amerindian Heritage Month. And it was not until mid-year, when the majority of the COVID-19 restrictions were lifted, that the ministry decided to host a month of activities, as was done pre-pandemic. Sir, this is a clear abuse of the contingencies fund because it does not meet the requirements. This honorable, this, honorable this, member, Miss Lawrence. You, so you, ask, September. you ask me to di direct that question to the Honorable Minister of Finance yes, as, Ashley, as yes. abuse of the contingency fund. I'm asking you can you. save the lecture, right? No, 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 so I'll lecturing. give, the, I'll give the Honorable Minister of Finance an opportunity to answer if this is an abuse of the contingency fund. No, but may I say, sir, because I don't think you heard but, the last part, to the Honorable Minister, the budget was passed, yes, in March, but this activity was in September. Why haven't we not gone to the Consolidated Fund? Why are we taking it from the Contingencies Fund? And Minister responsible for finance, Dr. Ashley Singh, said COVID-19 created a lot of uncertainties. And it was not until the numbers were under decline that the government opted to expand its calendar of activities for Amerindian Heritage Month. 
the evolving public health situation permitted us to reconsider the scale, structure, and design of the observance. And because we were able to contain COVID-19 in the manner that we did, we decided as a responsible government committed to the Amerindian people of our country to have a full observance. And it is very telling, sir, it is very telling that the APNU-AFC would now stand in this house and seek to question and challenge this allocation to the Amerindian people of Guyana. And I'm appalled at that, sir. The finance minister said the line of questioning by the opposition was very telling. But the opposition leader said the coalition remains committed to the indigenous people of Guyana. However, it must still defend the country's resources. He keep mentioning unforeseen, but the law says unforeseen and urgent. Now, Mr. Speaker, if in March, if in March, uh, if in March COVID went, you had between March and September, how come then, yes, we admit it's unforeseen, but it could not have been urgent if you have until September to apply to the consolidated fund. The reason it was done is because for the consolidated fund, you have to get parliamentary approval and they want it to be arbitrary and dictatorial as they normally are. Today's approved advances also included approximately $740.1 million for the Agriculture Ministry, $360 million for the Ministry of Natural Resources, and just over $50.5 million for the Ministry of Home Affairs. In a move that could possibly affect the conduct of local government elections in March of next year, the opposition APNU AFC has moved to the courts to have the preliminary list of voters for the local government elections scrapped. In the application filed by Chief Scrutineer of the APNU AFC, Carol Smith Joseph, against the Ghana Elections Commission, the Chief Election Officer, and the Attorney General, the opposition is seeking a total of 14 declarations and four orders intended to nullify the preliminary list and give rise to a new register of voters. Through her attorney, Senior Counsel Royceville Ford, Ms. Joseph has asked the High Court to declare that the Elections Commission acted unlawfully when it opted not to compile the preliminary list of voters for local government of elections in accordance with the Local Authorities Elections Act. Further, Ms. Joseph is asking the court to rule that GCOM is required to act in accordance with Section 11 of the Local Authorities Act in compiling the preliminary list of voters and further, that it is legally required to prepare a register of voters for use at the elections for local authority areas in accordance with several sections of the same act. Through her attorney, Ms. Joseph said failure to comply with the legislation would render the register of voters for local elections null, void, and of no legal effect. She is also asking the court to declare that the constitutional duty of the Elections Commission, as provided for in Article 162 of the Constitution, is to compile a register of voters, imposes a duty to compile a reasonably accurate and credible register of voters. The opposition chief scrutineer also wants a declaration that a register of voters extracted pursuing the Section 5-6 of the Election Laws Amendment Act by GCOM for use at the local elections is not reasonably accurate or credible, thereby making the same unconstitutional, unlawful, null, void, and of no legal effect. She's asking the court to declare that Section 5-6 of the Election Laws Amendment Act consequent upon the judgment of the High Court in the Ram versus Attorney General case is obsolete unworkable and wholly ineffectual as a law for the peace, order and good governance. On behalf of his client, the senior counsel is asking the court to issue an order setting aside the order issued by the Elections Commission for the purpose of extracting a list of electors for local government elections on the grounds that it is ultra-virus and unlawful. They are also seeking an order directing GCOM to compile a register of voters in accordance with Section 23 of the Local Authorities Act. It's November already and soon it will be Christmas, so we at John Lewis Styles are giving away one Amazon Echo Show every week in November and every day in December. Stream music and videos, make video calls and control smart devices, alarms, reminders and lots more. Every $5,000 spent gives you a chance to win when you shop for clothing, footwear, watches, fragrances, handbags, luggage and accessories. So visit us on Waterloo Street. John Lewis Styles, simply different. Did you know that the government has funded the 2022 budget through oil revenues? 
Yes, money earned from oil production offshore is being used to support projects in Guyana, including social programs like the increase of public assistance and old age pension, as well as cash grants to support the vulnerable members of society. GBTI Quick Cash Christmas is back. Just the way you like it. Get up to $500,000 easy for anything you want this Christmas. We are waiting on Santa. We buy and we own this Christmas. Apply at your nearest branch or online at www.gbtibank.com from October 15th to December 31st. GBTI, we see Christmas through your eyes. Terms and conditions apply. A very, very Guyanese Christmas. Former head of the Tactical Services Unit of the Guyana Police Force, Superintendent of Police, Guy Nurse, today denied allegations that he had given instructions to his subordinates to escort the chairman of GCOM, retired Justice Claude Singh, out of GCOM's command center when pandemonium broke out of the Ashman's building on the 5th of March in 2020. Superintendent Nurse appeared before the Commission of Inquiry into the 2020 elections in response to a summons he received on the 2nd of December. He told the commission that at no time did he give the TSU ranks who were in standby at the Brigdan Police Station any instruction to get the GCOM chairman out of Ashman's. According to him, it was not until the TSU ranks returned to the police headquarters at Ivalary that he was notified of the evacuation. I wasn't aware that um, they moved from Brigdan to Ashman's to move the, um, the GCOM. No, the Ashmans believe. No, were not aware. I would not believe it. Because they returned to headquarters to right. the beast at the around 6 p.m. Right, and I didn't even have, got the opportunity to talk to them when they returned, as you would see later on. Right, um, because remember, during that time, they would be under the command of the Division. commander of 4E, assistant. His testimony contradicts earlier statements given by Deputy Superintendent of Police Ronald Alley, who was also attached to the TSU. Last week, Mr. Alley told the commission that it was Superintendent Nurse who had instructed him and Deputy Superintendent Clifton Davis to escort the GCOM chair out of the Ashman's building. But today, Nurse told the Commission of Inquiry that he was attending to other duties on the 5th of March. He explained that ahead of the 2nd of March elections in 2020, the then Commissioner of Police, Leslie James, had instructed him to have part of his unit on standby at the Brigdan Police Station until otherwise advised. He said the group was led by Deputy Superintendent Clifton Davis and was under the command of the Commander of A Division, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Edgar Thomas. But Mr. Thomas, who was among the first witnesses to appear before the commission had testified that much to his surprise deputy superintendent davis and deputy superintendent ali turned up at the command center and instructed that the building be evacuated they were subsequently supported by 15 fully armed tsu ranks mr thomas told the commissioners that the presence of the tsu ranks was a clear breach of standard operating procedures and that could only have been there on the instructions of the police commissioner the government has procured a $50.5 million analysis workflow system for the Ghana Forensic Science Laboratory. That's according to Minister of Home Affairs, Robson Ben. He told the Committee of Supply that as he sought approval for advances taken from the Consolidated Fund. In defending the purchase, Minister Ben said the machine will boost the DNA testing capability of the forensic laboratory and will significantly reduce the backlog of cases that require DNA tests once it is properly set up. We expect within five or six months, once it's properly up and running, we will be on top of the situation in respect of having the ability to do proper sample cleaning, proper testing, and providing the right analytical results at more than 95% in relation to all types of DNA samples. Ben also said a new machine will replace one that was procured in 2017 but was performing below expectation. While it did a number of runs, it fell below the requisite standards and capability in requests in relation to doing complete analysis related to DNA for criminological investigations. Further than that, and that is to say the machine could not run analyses for degraded samples. 
So perhaps if there was a fresh blood or a flesh sample, you would get some result with maybe 75-80% accuracy. So that was a problem in itself. It could not run degraded blood or bone samples. He also said the compounded situation, the company which had manufactured the machine was sold to a larger company, Thermo Fisher Scientific, which had stopped producing the machine and supplying the necessary reagents needed to do analysis. Thermo Affairs Minister said in the interim the samples are being sent abroad to be tested. It was further disclosed that five DNA analysts will soon be certified to operate the DNA analysis workflow system. Three days after he was arrested along with three others for being in possession of more than seven pounds of cocaine and just over three pounds of marijuana, a Georgetown man has pleaded guilty to drug trafficking charges. 28-year-old Charleston resident Jalvin Ragnott appeared before the chief magistrate today and pleaded guilty to being in possession of the cocaine and marijuana for the purpose of trafficking. He accepted full responsibility for the drugs which were discovered by Kano agents during a drug investigation on Friday. Two other suspects, Jan Sigarway and Charles Jones, who were also arrested with Ragnot, appeared in court this morning also to answer to the same charges. The two men pleaded not guilty but were denied bail and have both been remanded to jail. A woman who was with the three when the arrests were made has not been charged. Kano agents were conducting a surveillance exercise in the Church Street area on Friday when they pursued Ragnar to his Charlestown home where a search was conducted and the quantity of marijuana and cocaine was found. The others were arrested at the same time and all taken to Kano headquarters where they were interrogated. With his guilty plea today, the Chief Magistrate has set the 21st of December for sentencing for a self-confessed drug trafficker. We go to we. Census takers are visiting communities across Guyana and collecting information from every household. This information will help the government to plan better for our country's development. All the information shared will be treated as strictly confidential and everyone is asked to participate. No one should be alarmed about any question asked because the answers provided will help to improve living standards, decrease community crime rates, and improve access to housing and health care, among other benefits. The census gives us the tool to identify some of these important gaps that exist across communities, within communities, and across regions, so that we can have targeted intervention. Yeah, we count in way From region 1 to region 10 The whole country Yeah, we count in way Food Max Supermarket, located on the ground floor of the Giftland Mall, is your one-stop shop for all your grocery needs. We stock a variety of imported frozen meat and food products, fresh produce and pet supplies, freshly made bread, rotisserie chicken and patties are also available daily. Shop in comfort today at Food Max and let our courteous staff assist you in satisfying your shopping needs. Food Max, the fresh food specialist. It's one of your biggest goals, getting your own home, where memories are made, where happiness lives. You may feel that home ownership or renovation is beyond your reach, but we at Republic want you to know that there's always a way. Ask us about our suite of mortgages. Let's help make your housing wishes come true. Or advise on how the equity in your existing home can finance other dreams and goals. Call or go online to learn more. When a full game is set up, Xbox X, gaming chair, gaming speaker and headset, or any of over 60 weekly prizes, like Oculus Quest 2, Mini 2 Drone, Nintendo Switch, and many more top gaming prizes. Check below for details. Fuel it up and drive, super, 95, Super 95 gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance, and high mileage, choose Guyol's Super 95 gasoline. Fuel it up and drive!
across the region tonight. A refining unit that turns crude oil into fuel at Venezuela's largest crude processing facility has broken down, halting production at a key gasoline producing plant. The breakdown of the fluid catalytic cracker caused the country's largest refinery to halt gasoline production on Thursday. Sluggish output from the state-run oil companies' refineries, which are operating at a fraction of their processing capacity, has caused intermittent fuel shortages in the South American country. The state-run oil company did not reply to a request for comment on the issue. Venezuela's refineries suffer frequent outages leading to production losses due to system failures and a lack of supplies. Two of the refineries produce more than 955,000 barrels of oil per day. On the eve of elections in Dominica, the electoral office in the island is reminding electors that during all elections, the secrecy of the ballot and the protection of the secrecy are of ultimate importance and guaranteed by law. Chief Electoral Officer Ian Michael Anthony said that as they should be aware the electorate, they go out and cast their votes on election day. And he wants to take the opportunity to emphasize a very important aspect of the country's electoral process, which is the secrecy of the ballot. He explained the process that protects the elector's secrecy even after he or she has returned from the voting booth and the portion of the ballot containing the ballot number is removed before that ballot is cast. He said the secrecy of their vote is guaranteed. The Electoral Office in Dominica is encouraging all registered voters to cast their ballots on election day tomorrow. And finally tonight, international news. A landslide on a road in the province of Risarlada in western Colombia has killed at least 27 people, the country's president has announced. The bus full of passengers was among several vehicles buried on the mud and rocks, which tumbled down a hillside following heavy rains. One of the passengers helped his wife and two children escape from the bus before he was buried and died. At least three children are among those killed. The landslide happened in the early hours of Sunday morning on the road leading to the northern province of Choco. Witnesses said in the city bus a jeep and a motorbike had stopped on the road because of a car accident further ahead when parts of the hillside collapsed on top of them. And that's your news source evening bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley reporting and encouraging you to stay safe.